you. Uh, thank you, Garrett. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us for getting to good uh, this session on building a bus system in the Washington region that works for marginalized and underserved communities. Um, I am so pleased and honored to be joined by three great panelists, um, all of whom come from an advocacy background um, and have really, really good insights to share with you all um, and, at, and answer some questions. I also talk between each other about why our public bus system in the Washington region is so critical to achieving our Vision Zero goals. Um, that is one of the top goals of today's panel. Um, along with uh, encouraging uh, you all advocates and average, average citizens uh, to prioritize the role of bus um, transit in connecting marginalized communities to destinations of necessity and leisure, um, inspiring uh, local advocates to get involved um, ahead of uh, the, Re the Washington Region's Bus Network redesign um, and to raise awareness about a very, very near an issue that is increasingly near and dear to my heart, um, which is the importance of bus shelters in both um, achieving equity, um, but also improving the quality of bus service um, across our region. Um, and as I already said, our panelists uh, each have extensive experience as advocates um, and one soon to be in government taking that advocacy experience. Um, so, Again, I want to begin by um, doing some speaker introductions. Um, so I'm going to pass it on first to Jane, and then she'll be followed by Faith, and then lastly, Max will round it all off. And I'm going to pass it to Jane to take it off to introduce herself. Oh, and I have a question for our panelists. Um, along with your introductions, um, can you tell the to us what you see as the connection between improved bus service and marginalized communities with our Vision Zero strategies? All right. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Jane Lyons. I'm the Maryland Advocacy Manager with Coalition for Smarter Growth. Um, and can you say that question one more time, Ron? Yes. Uh, what do you see as the connection between improving bus service and minority communities, or marginalized communities, excuse me, um, to achieving uh, our Vision Zero goals? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think that they're completely interconnected. Um, a lot of times people, and I'll talk about this a little bit in my presentation, but people who are, um, are hit and either killed or injured uh, while walking or biking or doing so because they're trying to get to a bus stop or to get to um, a train station. Um, and it's all a part of making sure that we are prioritizing uh, people who we haven't prioritized for the last many, many decades, um, people who are living in those marginalized communities and get around without a car, either because they can't afford it or for whatever other reason, um, and prioritizing those, prioritizing different modes of transportation outside of cars, but also the people in them. I think that's what's really is key, that when we prioritize bus service, when we prioritize pedestrians, when we prioritize bikes and bike racks and bike infrastructure. Um, it's not just about prioritizing a mode or prioritizing a certain way of living. It's prioritizing the people who it serves as well. Um, and so, yeah, with um, the Coalition for Smarter Growth, um, I work in Montgomery County uh, primarily on housing, land use, and transit uh, uh, policy issues. So uh, focusing on how all of those things sort of interplay and interweave with each other. Um, and uh, it's been really fantastic. I'll talk a little bit more later about the work um, that I've done uh, specifically around transit advocacy in that role. Thank you, Jane. And um, uh, I'm gonna just for remind of our other panelists, because that was a, it's a big question, as Jane's big answer uh, clearly demonstrated. Um, and I don't say it in a bad way, it's a big and brain power uh, answer. Um, so next we are gonna go to Faith. So Faith, uh, your role, the organization you're representing, and what do you see as the role um, between improving bus service in marginalized communities and achieving Vision Zero goals um, in the Washington region? Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you so much for inviting me to have this conversation. My name is Faith Walker. I'm executive director for RVA Rapid Transit um, here in the Richmond region. And um, what I see the correlation between the 
marginalized communities and the Vision Zero. Um, and why frequent and far reaching public transportation is so important is because majority of the times, especially in the Richmond region, I can imagine in other regions, uh, most marginalized groups depend on public transportation. They have no other option. And so um, this is critical to their economic growth, um, connections with family, and even, um, even social determinants of health. I think if we think about all the social determinants of health, transportation really is the backbone and glue for them all because you can't get to a great doctor if you can't get there. Um, you can't get to great groceries if there's no way to get there. So, um, so I think transportation is very key um, to marginalized communities in their economic growth, their health, and all of the above. So that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you, Faith. Um, and lastly, we're going to start, we're going to turn to uh, Mr. Max Rich, Mr. Mac Richman. Please introduce yourself. Excuse me. Thank you, Ron. Um, and I'm really honored and humbled to be on a panel with such fierce advocates uh, like Jane and Faith, who represent incredible organizations doing such great work. I do not. I am not part of such an organization. I am a, a lowly citizen of the District of Columbia um, who has been uh, had the privilege to be on the Bicycle Advisory Council representing my ward that I live in, Ward 7, east of the Anacostia River, uh, for these last three years. Um, and so, yeah, as the humble citizen advocate, um, I appreciate being on a panel with such powerhouses here. Um, my own personal take on your question is different. I agree with both of what the other um, speakers said, but the reason why so many people are dying on the roads are um, because there are so many automobiles that are going so quickly. So I want to like name that and call that. And it's not just the automobiles, it's the drivers of those automobiles. Why do they have to be in these automobiles? Because it's increasingly expensive to live in DC, so they've got to live further out. And what are we doing? We're expanding highways and roadways and making them look faster and faster and faster. And what is that doing? That's killing cyclists, that's killing pedestrians. So all of these things are interlinked. Because as soon as we have rapid, dedicated bus lanes, as soon as we're prioritizing moving people in larger numbers, we are literally saving lives. So the interconnection between the cycling work that I've been doing over the last three years on the Bicycle Advisory Council, it's become abundantly clear that the bus is probably one of the fastest ways to cycling safety that we can see in addition to building connected and protected bike lanes. Thank you, Max, uh, for, again, I think we clearly have a great panel um, uh, uh, before us today. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Ron Thompson, a junior. I work at Greater Greater Washington. Uh, most of you all know us as Gigi Wash, as policy officer, where I manage a coalition of direct service and advocacy organizations that are based or focused in part in the District of Columbia called the DC Transportation Equity Network. So with all the introductions out of the way, let's get to the meat of the program. Um, and so I do want to give a few housekeeping rules to our audience. Um, please, please, please put your uh, questions in the Q&A um, in the chat. And at the end of our program, we will have um, audience Q&A and then a the brainstorming session that I hope is fun for everybody. Um, but with that, we are going to begin with uh, Jane Lyons of uh, the Coalition for Smarter Growth um, to talk a bit about um, bus, network, bus network redesigns in our region. Um, specifically her experience in Montgomery County and in the city of Maryland. So, um, Jane, I pass it on to you. All right, let me get my uh, slides up here. Okay, can you see them all right? Yep, they're good on my screen. I think if anything else will they'll let us know. Great. All right, so uh, I want to start out by talking about how um, bus service and bus ridership over, or not as much bus service but bus ridership over the course of the pandemic has really been a lot more resilient uh, than uh, rail ridership so this right here is comparing metro rail and metro bus to its pre-pandemic levels uh, and as of april of this year uh, metro bus ridership was almost back to full uh, pre-pandemic levels at 88 percent while Metro Rail was still uh, down at 38% of pre-pandemic levels. So 
Uh, the bus has really continued to be the backbone of a lot of transit service in uh, in this region. And this is only looking at Metro bus, but uh, we've seen similar things with the local agencies as well. Um, and when we talk about, you know, where these bus routes are and how people are getting to them, as I was referencing earlier, um, a lot of where these, uh, especially metro bus routes run, are on these major arterial roads that uh, you can see here. Uh, if you're familiar with Montgomery County, uh, are a part of Montgomery County's high injury network. Um, so sort of standing out here, you can see uh, Connecticut Avenue, Georgia Avenue, um, uh, 355, and some of the places where there is highest uh, transit ridership. There, it's also the least safe to walk to the bus stop. Uh, and so there are two separate initiatives that I wanna talk about quickly in this presentation, and that's the WMATA regional bus redesign, and then Montgomery County is undergoing its own uh, bus redesign. And I will talk a little bit about the advocacy that I've been leading around that. Uh, but first with the, the WMATA regional bus redesign, uh, there's not too much to report out on that because it's still in pretty early stages, um, but those conversations are happening. Um, I, I've heard that WMATA is working on their scope of work right now and getting together with a contractor, um, as well as sort of figuring out what their different arrangements will be with each of the jurisdictions within the WMATA compact, because uh, there are certain places that have either recently done their own bus redesigns or are undergoing their own initiatives like Montgomery County. Uh, and so everywhere is a little bit different. One of the fun challenges that WMATA always has to deal with. Um, and so still in the early stages, but this is certainly something that is a priority. Um, and it came uh, maybe not directly out of, but sort of out of this larger push with the Washington Area Bus Transformation Project that began back in 2018. I think that was really um, uh, got us into the headspace as a region of thinking about buses more and about how uh, about how they can really be a huge uh, way to advance transit equity and to support our economy and to move us to um, a more sustainable transportation system. So I have here on the right a little graphic of with the bus transformation project, some of the um, findings there about what people wanted to see. Um, so more frequent service, not unsurprisingly, was number one, more reliable and faster service, more direct buses with fewer transfers, the things that we would sort of expect to see. And so these are things that the Bus Transformation Project created this fantastic action plan um, for how all the different transit agencies throughout the region can work together to address that. Um, and so there's now also the Metro Now Coalition, which first came together around dedicated uh, metro rail funding uh, is now also really making the bus a big priority. Um, so what is possible with a bus redesign? So there's a lot of text here, but um, I, I won't read through all of it, but essentially making the system better, addressing all of those concerns that were identified in the bus transformation project. Um, I have a little graphic here that I think really uh, shows the strength of what a bus redesign can do. Um, this is from Miami-Dade County um, and how a lot of its network before the redesign was 30 or 60 minutes with maybe only a few 15 minute frequent routes. Um, but after the redesign, uh, they were really able to make it more efficient and more frequent and improve transit service. Uh, but of course, transit service is probably the most important thing, but it's not the only thing. Um, there's also aligning payment systems and fare structure, um, uh, uh, coordinating on existing and planned bus priority infrastructures like bus lanes. Uh, so there's a lot that would be a part of a regional redesign. Uh, and uh, also wanted to tie in like who rides Metro bus. Uh, this is, I think is a really good graphic because it not only shows the demographics of who are Metro bus customers, but also how does that compare to the rest of the region? Um, and so right now we see that 52% of uh, Metro bus riders live in a household with an income less than $30,000 a year. Um, over half of Metro bus riders don't 
own a car in their household. Um, 81% are uh, minorities. Um, so it really gives a pretty clear picture that uh, it's when we're talking about bus ridership, um, we're, we're inherently also talking about uh, equity and racial equity and social justice. Um, so it's incredibly important that we move forward on the regional redesign um, uh, to address all of these things for both equity, for climate change, to support our economy, um, and to have a more integrated bus system throughout the region. So now to talk a little bit quickly about the Ride on Reimagine study is Montgomery County's local initiative to improve its bus system. Uh, it will cover both Ride on and Metro bus, which uh, we were really excited to see. That's something that we specifically advocated for. Um, and it will be both uh, it has study in the name, so it's going to be both an assessment of the existing system, but we'll also include a service implementation plan for how to uh, make the system better. Um, and that's a little bit further along than the regional bus redesign, and since it's um, a local initiative, we'll hopefully move a good bit faster. Um, they just kicked off um, everything with a stakeholder meeting. Uh, and now this month they will, are conducting a survey and pop-ups at different transit centers around the county. Uh, so here is a um, timeline of how that will proceed, although I know that oftentimes these timelines can always shift, um, but hopefully this will be something that will be complete um, within the next uh, uh, year or two. Uh, and the scope of work for that has been completed. So I pulled out some key quotes here from that that connect with Vision Zero. That's going to look at um, one of the top priorities of Ride On is safety and Vision Zero. Um, so that will be uh, paired with measurable outcomes for the implementation plan. It'll look at protocol for floating bus stops and pedestrian access evaluate accessibility and sidewalk access and all of that good stuff. Um, and who rides right on? Um, I won't dig too deep into this because this is very similar to the uh, data from the uh, Metro bus ridership. Um, one of the big findings there was that the median income is $35,000 in Montgomery County. Uh, and so enter the Montgomery County Better Buses Coalition. So this coalition is organized by uh, Coalition for Smarter Growth um, and me being the Montgomery County person of that. Uh, and so back in um, this time of year, I, I guess about a year ago, um, did a lot of outreach and bringing together of different folks from all of these organizations. And you can see here that this includes um, service organizations such as Shepherd's Table, it includes um, housing groups such as Habitat for Humanity, Housing Unlimited. It includes um, grassroots groups like CASA and Identity, um, uh, UFCW Local 1994 McGeo, which represents bus operators, their labor union. Um, so it's been really great to bring so many different partners together um, to create, um, and you're not supposed to be able to read this necessarily, but this is a, a screenshot of our platform that we all worked really hard to create together. Um, and there's a few other pages of it as well. But this was really an exercise on how it is so beneficial to have a lot of different voices at the table. Um, there are things that I would have never thought to include that, um, you know, having McGeo at the table, they say we need to include this and being able to talk to actual bus operators about what needs to be improved um, was, was really uh, fantastic. Uh, and so uh, this is the last slide here, I believe. Some of our major achievements as a coalition has been to extend free fares four times over two years of the pandemic. We now have $1 fares going forward and permanent free fares for seniors and people with disabilities, uh, pay increases for bus operators, construction funding for future BRT. Um, and we've sort of tried to keep a in close step and close watch on uh, this these early stages of the Ride on Reimagine study, study by submitting uh, really detailed comment letters on uh, both the scope of work and then providing our recommendations on how outreach can be done in a way that is um, uh, meaningful and engages with the community in a deep way. Oh yeah, and so this is the last slide, uh, talking about how free fares alone are not enough, since a lot of our advocacy as a coalition up to this point is focused on that, uh, this shows that 
uh, really together with better service, uh, we'll be able to achieve um, more of our goals. And thank you, Jane, for that amazing presentation. I also want to thank Jane for a few months ago, maybe it feels like a year ago, um, joining Gigi Wash uh, to talk about her work in Montgomery County on buses then. And, um, we're not over yet, but we're gonna move on to, I wanna uh, congratulate uh, Jane again on her uh, position um, in the city of Rockville, or the town of Rockville. But um, thank you so much, Jane. And now we're gonna move, she ended on a perfect note. We're gonna to go to uh, Faith Walker, executive director of um, RVA Rapid Transit to talk about uh, one of uh, the campaigns um, that uh, RVA Rapid Transit um, fought for and won. So Faith, you can take it away. All right, can you hear me okay? Awesome, all right. Y'all bear with me. <laughs> there we go. All right, so again, hello guys. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Again, my name is excuse me, Faith Walker, Executive Director for RVA Rapid Transit. And um, Ron asked me to share the Zero Fare campaign. And this is definitely one of the campaigns that we are working on here in Richmond, Virginia. And so I'll, I'll just love to share with you um, about that campaign. Now, who are we? Um, RVA Rapid Transit is a nonprofit here in the Richmond region. We advocate for frequent and far reaching public transportation in the Richmond region. And um, I think uh, this last year or last two years, we really shifted our focus on um, our advocacy. And our advocacy is not based on folks who believe in public transportation. Of course, we all do. But we wanted to make sure our advocacy is centered around what the writer is saying. Um, and especially people who depend on public transportation and have no other option. And so one of the things that we identified is folks wanted to see more buses go more places, people having dignified places to wait while they're waiting on the bus, and then the writer's voice is being elevated in decision-making and planning. And so that's centered around the work that we do. And so who rides the bus? Um, Jane mentioned a lot of data that sort of lines up with Richmond. Um, so this is data from uh, 2019 that our Richmond leaders or our Richmond agency did. Um, and so 54% of bus riders earn less than 25,000, 27% um, earn less than 10,000, 64% are black and then 57% uh, are female. So if you were to just sum up um, who rides the bus here in Richmond, Virginia is black full-time working females who make under $25,000. And so why does zero fare make sense? As you can imagine, zero fare may make sense for every region. Um, I see that there are some wins that Jane mentioned that um, regions around the nation are choosing certain things to be free. But, um, but this is why it makes zero fare for, for the entire system, why it makes sense in Richmond. Um, low income riders spend more money. And so, you know, generally you can pay $60 a month for a monthly pass, but writers um, who are making under 25K are generally don't have that $60 a month to pay up front. Um, they're spending money per trip, per ride, and that's more expensive. And so they're spending upwards to a thousand annually. Now I mentioned before that 27% of ridership in the Richmond region make under 10,000. That's 10% 10 of their income. So although a thousand may not seem much to, to most folks, but for folks who are using public transportation in our region, that's a big chunk of funds. 1.7 million to collect 4 million. So um, GRTC estimated that this year, if fares were to establish, $6.8 million was going to be collected in fares. Now, when I say collected, that means fares across the board because some um, organizations like VCU want to make sure that their employees as well as their students ride the bus for free. So they tap in or they pay a portion of that 6.8 million. 
Now, also other um, organizations and businesses also pay up front for their employees or students. But if you look at about $4 million from that 6.8 million actually is collected physically at the bus stop. So what we're saying is we're, we're asking 4 million or that 4 million is coming off the backs of people who generally can't really afford public transportation and we're spending 1.7 million to collect it. So as you can imagine, um, it costs funds to keep those machines inside the bus up to date with technology um, and even collecting the fares up, upwards to 1.7 million. But also it reduces idle time. And so there's less emissions, but also it increases frequency. And so instead of uh, multiple people, a bus can stop every two blocks. And so if uh, multiple people are loading the bus that keeps the bus moving. Um, and then also equity, this is an equity issue. It's transportation justice. Um, as you can imagine, many neighborhoods around the nation um, dealt with redlining. So in, with our city and with multiple cities, I'm pretty sure that buses were only designed and made for those redlined areas. So only majority of pe people who were using the bus um, were centered around the city. And so now as we move forward, when some of those uh, policies have changed, now when we're looking about going into the counties and things, that transportation line doesn't exist and people are trying more hard, or excuse me, harder to, um, to move about the city and to find income and work. Now, 67% of folks don't have vehicles or a car. 49% don't have a driver's license. And one of the things that we found for our region is uh, people were still using the bus during COVID-19. We made national news as to why are people still using public transportation in the middle of a pandemic? Well, one of the reasons is they, they are essential workers. So these are the essential workers, the folks who are running our city. And so this is why we didn't see decreased ridership like other regions. Uh, is because the folks who use public transportation in Richmond, they have no other option. It's either ride the bus or don't have income. And so um, this really was a real eye opening for our organization to see, hey, this is why zero fare makes sense. And so what I wanted to do, one of those things uh, for a part of our advocacy is we collected writer stories. And so this is what we use to share that message. And I just wanted to share a few of those with you. I think it being free still, the cons outweigh the, um, you know, the pros outweigh the cons with that because at one point I was having to pay $60 a month just for a, a pass, you know, to get back and forth to work and what have you. And that money, especially the time we're in now, definitely um, helps to stay in your pocket. I can't say that I wanted to go back to us paying. Uh, that would be foolish in a way. All right, and let's look, listen to Terrence. My name is Terrence Bryant. Um, I take bus routes 1C, 1A, and 1B. And um, I actually, I like that it's free because at this time, you know, I just started working and really if it wasn't for it being free, you know, I won't really have a ride to work. I'll probably have to walk. So, I mean, to me, that's that's one reason why I like zero fare. So those stories were really pivotal, excuse me, pivotal, and uh, uh, I can't get that word out, y'all, uh, and us um, advocating for zero fare, and I just wanted to share that with y'all. Um, you can definitely visit our website if you want to look at more stories. So here's a, just a quick zero fare timeline. So in March 2020, fares were implemented to reduce the spread of COVID. And so we realized, hey, we were talking to writers at bus stops and we were like, this needs to continue. So how did we continue that? We did op-ed campaigns. So what we did was we partnered with a lot of organizations. We asked them to write op-eds about zero fare just to raise awareness so that when people started learning about zero fare, they just weren't hearing it from one source. It was multiple sources talking about the issue. Another thing we did again, writers comment. So we uh, recorded writers, posted their stories, and it just circulated that. And then we also did town halls to get more awareness out. 
And so in December of 2021, the DRPT awards GRTC with $8 million matching grant. And that matching grant was from VCU and the city of Richmond. So fares were free through 2025. Oh, we, we celebrated, we got a win. So there is gonna be free fares through 2025. And then the, um, one of the things that DRPT wanted to happen is that starting July 22 of uh, this year, and through the 20, um, July 2025, there were going to be a study to measure the regional impacts of zero fare. And so we were so excited about that. So April 2022 came around and the $1 million pledge was not in the city's budget. Uh-oh. So the city of Richmond, you know, committed to this uh, 1 million. That's why the DRPT granted this match. Zero fare was at risk of being lost. And so we immediately did an emergency meeting. We got a letters of support for about 400 people. And then in May of 2022, GRTC came through and they approved 1 million from their own budget. And so this was some, um, some funds left over from COVID relief that they had on reserves. So they pulled that from their reserves to cover zero fare. Um, and then, so where are we now? it's up in the air, y'all. We don't know. Every year, it's going to find that match decline. So this year, um, GRTC came out of their budget. We're going to have to find a match $3 million next year, $5 million for the last year. And so right now, what we're doing is we're doing exactly this. We're explaining the impacts and the benefits of zero fare for our residents. And so we're also sharing what if fares come back. Fair enforcement. Right. So no, not only is the bus operator have all the responsibilities of driving the bus, now they're going to have to enforce fares. And what we know from marginalized communities, there's a high, there's higher rates of arrest um, in those communities. So we're going to, we will see a higher rate in arrest and interactions with the police in the event that someone can't pay. Um, also, is it increased in idle time? You know, once people realize, hey, I have to pay, they'll, they're digging for change or digging for cash. Um, and you don't get that back if you put a whole $5 bill. And so that that time is wasted. And then also a strain on riders with this economic time. Um, in, rent is increased. Food has increased. And now to have to pay um, for transportation that you haven't been paying for for a few years that's a huge burden on uh, folks who, de who depend on it most. And so lessons we've learned, I'll wrap it up with this. Um, partnerships are power. It's important for you to partner with other organizations in order to get the word out and get it done. Um, stories inspire action. So we've collected a large portion of these stories. We've, we've seen, I mean, I can tell you data all day, but sometimes people just don't move with data. Um, but, and sometimes people do, you know, it just, just depends on the crowd, but stories inspire action. And then also words have power. So be careful, be careful the op-eds you write, the politicians you call out, because they remember. So it's important that you, even though some of the things may be true, you navigate that waters because there could be a campaign that comes up next uh, and you need that help with. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you much, Dr. Thank you, Faith, and and um, you know, I, as as someone who has built up a coalition, uh, it, it is it's very true that there's power in cooperation. Excuse the helicopter that is passing over um, during our bus panel. Um, Max was a bit uh, uh, he, he undersold himself at the start of this. Um, Max Richmond is going to present next, and I consider Max uh, because of this presentation a bus hero, and Max is going to tell you about why I believe. He um, is a bus hero with, along with our other amazing panelists, but why he is a volunteer uh, bus uh, hero. So take it away, Max. Thanks for that, Ron. Um, and thanks again, Jane and Faith. You set it up so well, um, especially, you know, what you were just saying at the Faith, Faith at the end there about data. Um, data can sometimes move people, but sometimes it's just noise, right? And so... Um, in my day job, I'm a practicing data scientist working on clean energy. Uh, and by night, I like to try to use some of my superpowers to improve my community. And so one of the things that um, I'm going to be talking about here is one example of that. So 
using data that's publicly available in DC about bus shelters, I want to tell a story about bus shelters, both because they themselves should be equitably distributed, but also because I think it's emblematic of the challenges that underserved communities face when it comes to public investment, uh, including uh, transit and uh, transportation investments. Um, and so with that, um, I'm gonna show you this map here, free maps really. Um, can you all see my screen all right? Great, okay, so take, take that as a yes. So this is a map from Move DC, which is the Department of Transportation's um, strategic plan for what to do in the years ahead. And on the very landing page, the page where you arrive, this is the map that they put out there. This map shows you um, a lot of what you've heard from Jane and from Faith, but distilled into like six colors. So how do you take all these variables of people of color, low income households, persons with disabilities, residents with low English, you take all those variables, you make an index out of them, and what does it look like in DC? And so for those that are familiar with DC, you notice some common patterns in the urban core, downtown, wards two, et cetera, you're able to get around pretty easily. And you can also see the black line of where the DC Metro goes, but then you'll also start to notice some dark purple areas, areas of greater need. Um, their index didn't specifically use the variable of lack of car ownership, but that is also highly correlated as you saw earlier from Faith and Jane. And so you start to see patterns particularly here in Ward 5, where there are these dark areas, as well as Ward 7, Kenilworth, uh, Mayfair, um, as well as in the Deanwood area where I live in Ward 7, and down through Ward 8. Um, so I just wanted to kind of level set people on where are some of the big transit equity needs? Where do we need to focus efforts, both based on um, historical injustices, but also on lack of access to transportation today? And so, uh, admirably, um, our, uh, oh, one other story that I wanted to tell uh, before I forget. Um, so part of the reason I started doing this analysis is in our little corner here of um, Northern Ward 7, uh, as you can see, there is a lot of need. Um, and so a number of advocates from ANC 7E uh, came together and put an op-ed together with uh, Greater Greater Washington and others in a campaign to push for a lot of the improvements that we want to see for Vision Zero. We've had way more fatalities east of the river here than any other part of the city. And so it's really critical that we make these investments to save lives. Um, and so as part of that work, they asked me to look at bus shelters and that's how I ended up pulling some of this data together. Um, I'll share this link if people wanna read the op-eds or look at Move DC and stuff like that. And the other story I wanna tell is in Deanwood where I've only lived for a few years, um, I've been able to see uh, a lot of change uh, in terms of public transportation. Um, for example, the circulators gonna be coming and things like that. But unfortunately, we're still very disconnected from a lot of the city. And we end up being kind of a highway for a lot of Maryland commuters coming in from PG County, um, which leads to clogged roads and a lot of difficulties. So I'm gonna move quickly to the next slide as I know we're, we've got, um, got to keep on going here. But the history of the Deanwood area is fascinating. We really encourage people to learn more about these communities. So historically, the Deanwood area is one of the areas where African Americans have owned land the longest in the District of Columbia. It's one of the first neighborhoods where Black families could buy land, as opposed to the rest of the city, which um, for, precluded that. And they were segregated and formed their own community and had walkable communities with dozens of grocery stores. You heard me right. There were dozens of grocery stores in the Deanwood area where today there is one that serves 70,000 people. And so what was the difference there is you had a whole economy set up where people were shopping from different shops and able to walk around and get around. Um, and since then, people have had to move further and further out and have to be driving further and further to get to their amenities, which leads to sprawl, which leads to all the cars, which leads to a lot of the deaths that we see from everyone needing an automobile. Okay, so Wamada has um, created bus stops to serve across the city. And that is where my next slide is, that it has created a fairly equal picture of where uh, bus stops are located. So the darker brown colors indicate we have some bus stops here up in uh, Ward 5, we have bus stops around Wards 3 and Wards 4, and we have bus stops pretty much all over the city. We have bus stops down here in Ward 8. Um, and so that's great. It's good that we have lots of bus stops for the many Wamata buses that run. We're also starting to see 
um, more buses that are coming specifically from the Department of Transportation, like the circulators and things. This is all great. More bus stops. We need to think about how they all fit together and work together. More bus stops is good. But sometimes when it's raining or it's hot, you want something over your head when you're at the bus stop. Or maybe you want to be able to know when the next bus is coming and you want to be able to read the little ticker that tells you when it's coming. Well, unfortunately, according to data from Open Data DC, published by the Department of Transportation, it does not look as equal or as equitable as we would want. So here's the picture of where the bus shelters are located. You'll notice a pattern. Many of them happen to be here in the western parts of DC, which tend to be the more affluent and white areas of DC. And you'll notice, remember, the heavy bus ridership and transportation needs in the eastern part and in the northern part of the city will have much lower percentages of bus stops. I will caveat to say that this data was from 2021 and maybe a whole bunch of bus shelters have gone on or maybe the data wasn't coded, but even the fact of what we're counting as data uh, is very important. So whether the data is wrong and behind the times or the data reflects the reality that there are not enough bus shelters in areas that have been burdened by being able by not being able to access the city as equitably as others, this is something that we need to fix. And so with that, uh, I'll just flash back quickly to the previous map to let people know again, lots of bus stops all over the city, needs particularly east of the river and in Ward 5, and unfortunately, that's not really where the bus shelters are looking. With that, I will pause, uh, stop sharing, and hand back to you, Ron. Oh, I put myself back on mute. Thank you so much, Max. Um, and we are going to end our panel session with just kind of uh, and and from here from our panelists. Um, and I'll start with you, Max, since you finished. Um, what? you know, takeaways you walk away from your colleagues on the panel here um, about, you know, the connections between Vision Zero um, and, and improving bus service. Um, but, you know, you talked about this a great deal in your presentation about the role, the interconnectedness of walkable communities that are less car dependent and the role in fostering um, healthy economies in, in a black community, a sort of black community, um, and what happens when those things are absent. So. What are some takeaways that you have um, from you know, your co-panelists? Good, you're testing my listening comprehension. I was listening. Um, so both Faith and Jane pointed out that what a lot of us advocates know, which is you know, the bus ridership is highest among low income and vulnerable and marginalized folks. But they're not the only bus riders. And I think what's also telling from both of their groups is the alliances and partnerships that you're able to form across socioeconomic boundaries to advocate for common needs. I live in Ward 7. I am not a low income person, but I love riding the bus. I took the X9 today and I was able to quickly get across town when I needed to and connect to a bike. So I think that the takeaway that I wanna add on top of what I'm hearing from them, especially for people who are part listening in on this panel today, is as a cyclist, as a multimodal urbanist, as somebody who wants to be have safer streets, advocating for the bus is the most logical thing that we can be doing. It's making it safer for all of us and at the same time addressing historical inequities. How can you not want that? <laughs> and I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really, at the point that you make about uh, bus lanes being good for bike lanes. I know we talk about the conflicts between the two, but you know we've seen examples of them working together, or they, you know, one bus lane working uh, to carry uh, dozens and dozens of buses. I mean, those and bikes and cyclists. So I think that's a very important important point you make um, in a conversation that we oftentimes see uh, road space that have been for good vehicles, good vehicles uh, pitted against one another. Um, Jane, one, one last point that I forgot to make that you just sparked and then I'll, I'll cut out, which is I wanted to use the bus shelters as an example. I wanted it not because if we fix bus shelters, we fix the issue, but the issue of bus shelters stems from a lot of our public policy, which only gets delivered where people scream the loudest or get listened to or paid attention to because people do scream loud in Ward 7 for things and are ignored. So I don't wanna say that like, it's not just because we put in enough 311 tickets, but I really wanna challenge policymakers who are listening here uh, or who might become policymakers soon to remember that um, you know it's not enough to, just sort of make certain things available. Like, oh, people can just request bus shelters and you'll get them. But we really need to be thinking about how we bring those services as a common good and prioritize their implementation in areas that have historically not had them. And there are also risks and pitfalls to that. Part of the challenge is it takes more engagement in these communities, not less. 
So I'm not saying just steamroll communities and put whatever transportation investments that you want, because that's going to backfire. That's going to have the communities reject them, destroy them, and not be bought into them. So it's going to take more equitable investment in the engagement process itself and not to achieve the kinds of outcomes that we want to see. Listen, I, I'm bus hero, I, you know, I, I, the designation, it, it fits. Um, I want to uh, hear from Jane, because um, I see you next. Uh, you know, can you share any insights that you've learned um, either from the work of your colleagues, your prior knowledge or what you've heard today um, on the panel? Um, any, you know, some kind of key takeaways? Yeah, no, I think that this was really fantastic. And I'm glad that I got to see both of these presentations um, with, with Max's uh, data visualization. Um, that is just so cool to actually be able to see. Um, in Montgomery County, we have apparently a bus shelter, bus stop inventory somewhere. And I've asked for it to be made public, uh, you know, <laughs> long time ago, and that has not happened yet. So uh, I think that there's a lot more that we can do with overall data transparency in transit that can really help advocates to know and agencies to know where to focus um, and where the gaps are. Because um, a lot of these things should be pretty low hanging fruit, um, especially something like having a bench at a bus stop. Uh, you, you would you would think that that's something that we should be able to achieve everywhere uh, in in DC, in Montgomery County, throughout the region. Um, we should be a model for the rest of the country and the rest of the world for how to do these things right. Um, and then with Faith's uh, fantastic presentation about what's happening uh, with RVA, um, what was really inspiring to me there was just the similarities of the issues that we're grappling with and working on um, in both Richmond and in Montgomery County, and that a lot of these things are sort of, these are not just isolated conversations. These are things that we're all talking about and existing in the same sort of like struggle to how to balance these things about, free fares or to collect fares or to subsidize fares for some or, and uh, you know, what's fantastic about conversations and uh, conferences like this is that we all get to sort of see more of that uh, shared struggle, but also shared celebration of the achievements and the things that we have all come together to, to learn and to learn from each other. What, what a great point, Jane. And um, there's something you said, I'm May come back to it, but thank you for those, you know, for those those, those insights. Um, you talked about uh, uh, the commonalities and, and how uh, Faith and RVA Rapid Transit organized around fare free trans, um, fare free GRTC. Um, and I know that you've done work with uh, SCIU. Um, I believe, is, oh no, uh, one of the public uh, public sector unions in Montgomery County to build support around um, buses, and it, it's one of those illustrations of. Uh, to a point Faith made earlier about um, centering the riders, centering the voices of riders, not just the voices of advocates, which is something that we, as advocates, sometimes get lost in that, you know, we forget the riders sometimes, or we forget the people at the center of the issue. But um, thank you for those, you know, highlighting those parallels between uh, your work in Montgomery County and uh, Faith's work in Richmond. And I'm going to turn to Faith. Um, you know, do you have any takeaways from your uh, colleagues? Um, from this panel. Yeah, I just want to just piggyback off of Jane and um, the mention of fair free is not the only answer. Um, we need frequency as well. Um, and then most people feel like there's a trade off between the two. It doesn't have to be that way. I know for our region, we um, because we have implemented zero fare, our region is getting more state dollars because it increased in ridership. And so we're seeing um, this thing starting to pay for itself. And I think frequency um, us investing in frequency is what's going to pull people from their vehicles. So the vision of um, the vision zero is one of the things to move people out of their vehicles to reduce fatalities. And so if we're investing in a frequent mode of transportation, people will start to change their way of traveling and move out of their vehicles. Most people in our region, um, and I'm pretty sure other regions are not choosing to use the bus because it's not convenient. And so, um, and I think us focusing that 
on frequency and more buses, we can start to see a shift in the culture and people choosing to use public transportation versus riding a car. Um, also, I wanted to, to also talk about Max mentioned that the engagement needs to be uh, more. Uh, most folks in marginalized communities, the way they're communicated with through transit agencies or even um, consulting firms about what they want in their community is through surveys. And a lot of folks sometimes, um, and I know uh, a lot of folks may be in positions where they don't have laptops, access to smartphones. And so a lot of these things take that type of technology for them to respond. And you're, you're seeing the same groups of people respond to these messages, um, or excuse me, these surveys, and they're generally white, uh, females, or folks within that same uh, group of um, who, who the survey came from. And it's not a bad thing. It's great to hear from all folks, but the engagement and the investment engagement is gonna have to be so much more deeper. It's gonna have to be face-to-face. -face. It's gonna have to be at bus stops or where people ride their bike or wherever it is. And so it's, it's critical and important that we make sure that we are investing in the, um, the engagement in the marginalized communities. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you all. And so what we're going to do now is go to, uh, we have less than 10 minutes to get to some Q&A. So we're going to, we've been collecting questions that folks have submitted in the chat and um, in the uh, Q&A box. So let us start with a question that may have already been answered. I'm going to go through the, the numbered. Okay, let's see. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. I'm just scrolling. Okay, let's start with number two. Um, do you have thoughts? And I will start with uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on you, Jane. Um, do you uh, have thoughts on regional bus speed targets? Uh, this is a high-profile metric in New York City. It'd be great to see um, one of three metrics uh, that set our systems. Um, so the question I'm gonna, I'm not gonna read the whole comment. But the question is, do you have thoughts on a regional bus speed um, on bus speed targets? Uh, yeah, that's not something that I've heard a ton about here, but that is certainly a common metric used to measure success in transit throughout the world. Um, and I don't know exactly what would be a good target. Um, I believe that like right now we might be around an average of like 11 miles per hour or something like that, but don't quote me on that. Um, but I think that that would be a great, you know, when we're talking about frequency, it's really easy to, you know, talk about, you know, 10, 15 minute headways. Um, and that is something that gets the majority of attention. And we also like to talk about dedicated bus lanes in order to, um, in order to make bus trips faster. Uh, and I think a lot of the data that I've seen come out of once those uh, bus prioritization projects happen is like speeds increase or trip times uh, decreased by 30% or something like that. But it doesn't really usually report it in terms of average speed. So I wonder, uh, you know, maybe more questions than answers. I wonder if if we are measuring that in the DC region and if so, what they are. So good question. Wish I had a better answer. Thank you for that, that answer. Uh, Faith, do you have any insights on a uh, regional bus speed limit? I mean, bus speed targets, not limits, bus speed targets. No, I don't. I don't want to speak, speak on it. <laughs> uh, Max, you're the data guy. How do you feel about bus? And, and, and if not, I can just move on to the next question. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. Um, so clearly, I think, Jane, you, you hit the nail right in the head. There's definitely a need for more. I've heard of these uh, as well. There's definitely a need for more um, research. Okay, next question. Uh, are the speakers aware of any group that has done uh, something like the grading system turnaround? Uh, the grade, uh, yeah, the grading system turnaround has made for the New York City MTA, uh, but not for WMATA. Sorry, can you say that one more time? The grading so, system? The grading system that I guess New York City's bus turnaround project uh, utilized, and there is a link here to the grading system. Um, so any insights on like grading systems for our, the, the value in grading systems for bus systems um, by advocates, the use of them by advocates? Yes, yeah, no, Cheryl actually just put um, uh, our Metro uh, bus report card in the chat uh, from July 2019, uh, the DC Metro bus report card. Um, so that is one example. And I believe the um, 
Metro Now Coalition has been putting together reports that help to track uh, progress on the um, on the uh, bus transformation projects recommendations and also offers uh, sort of yeah tracking and reporting out there. Um, Faith, I, I guess I, I'm going to turn to the folks that work uh, in bus or have worked in buses in the buses business on the advocacy side. Um, I don't know if Richmond has had a similar kind of grading a grading system like uh, Metro Heroes or um, uh, the uh, Metro Now Coalition, or even you know the Bus Turnaround Project in New York, their grading system. But has Richmond, you know, prior to you all's bus that redesign, um, have any experience with grading grading systems of system performance for buses? Yeah, I, and that's all on GRTC's website, and so they have a, a whole list of um, how that that performance measures up. And so I would recommend if you want more or data from the city or our region, visit GRTC's website. Um, Max, any insights you'd like to share on grading systems? I, I want to try to get to as many questions. Um, I like data. Publish the underlying data and the measures. There we go. There we go from the get from the data guy. Okay, for Faith, uh, here you go. Do you have any recommendations on how uh, we can effectively message to policymakers that paying sixty dollars up front can be difficult for the typical rider? And do you have any data on whether on how often and, and uh, frequently uh, VCU riders use the bus in Richmond? I don't have any direct data on VCU students in particular using the bus. Um, that's a good question. Um, I can say that again, the stories count. It's difficult to explain to someone how $60 is a lot of money for them. Um, you can't do that. That's why the stories are important. And so if, you can, if you're having the ability to share impact stories. So um, one of the things I would do is ask a writer what is the impact of keeping $60 in your pocket? Them sharing that, telling you that story is more impactful than you trying to convince a policymaker. So that person can say, hey, I was able to purchase this for my family. I was able to buy this. I was able to save this. Um, this kept me from um, not paying my rent. And so those, th that's what I would do or use um, for policymakers. And um, I, I encourage folks to look at the Riders Voice uh, a series that RBA Rapid Transit. I love the I love the two is uh, the clip that was shown of Jewel, the Rider Jewel. Um, I love the two part. Um, we are basically at time. Um, I, I hope that we are able to get answer, questions answered that weren't answered here in some form or fashion to attendees. I want to thank our panelists um, for their amazing insights on uh, the things that all, you know, bus things happening from Richmond to DC. Um, and uh, thank you to WABA for uh, putting on this, the summit and for hosting this session. And you all have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.